I'm Ari Lewine, and I'm the co-founder and chief strategy officer of TripleLift and the IB co-chair of the Native Social and Content Committee. And I'm delighted and honored to be here today. I'd like to thank the IB for having me. In 1934, a devastating earthquake hit Nepal, six miles south of Mount Everest. Several hundred miles away, in Bihar, India, only minor tremors were felt from this earthquake. Every major building stood, and thankfully, nobody was seriously harmed. But something very strange and curious happened after that earthquake. Newspaper reports began emerging in Bihar, India, that there were major fatalities. In fact, that most of the major buildings in the town square had been destroyed. So the question becomes, why did these fake stories emerge in this province in India in 1934? And why would anyone believe them? And this question was sought to be answered by a scientist named Leon Fessinger. And he began to analyze and interview people in this province in India to see what had happened. And what had emerged was fascinating. He found out that people had two different thoughts in their minds. One was that they were scared. They were scared about what could have happened. And the other part of themselves is trying to rationalize that fear because, in fact, nobody was hurt. So they had no true reason to be fearful. And so he coined a term to describe this phenomenon. He called it cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance can very simply be described as knowing one thing, yet feeling or doing another. Let me give you an example of cognitive dissonance that's more recent. In America, the New York Times recently published a survey that asked Americans across the country, will global warming harm Americans? And overwhelmingly, about 55% of Americans said yes, global warming will harm Americans. But when they rephrased the question ever so slightly and said, will global, will global warming harm you personally? Only 25% said yes, which means that 25% of Americans believe global warming will harm everyone around them on their block, yet somehow avoid them. <laughs> That's cognitive dissonance. Now, you may be asking yourself, we're here at IEB Engage, what are we doing talking about earthquakes in India, scientists and cognitive dissonance? What does this have to do with online advertising and our day-to-day -day jobs? And what's fascinating is that cognitive dissonance actually dictates our behavior significantly. Let me give you a brief example. At TripleLift, we have 300 employees globally across all ages, all demographics. We asked our employees, how many of you have ad blocker? And exactly a quarter of our company had ad blocker installed. This is a company which each and every individual's livelihood is predicated on online advertising. And there's no more educated population that understands that online advertising is the lifeblood of information and the internet. And yet, that's cognitive dissonance. And so after the survey, we became incredibly curious to dive into this topic of cognitive dissonance and how we make decisions day to day in our work in online advertising. So we turned to a very interesting form of research called eye tracking. What eye tracking does is allows us to give insight into what people give attention to as they browse the internet. Now there's no way to do this in real time, but what we can do is bring in hundreds of people to do research on them to understand their browsing behaviors and what happens in their mind. And eye tracking allows us to do that. So we started by looking at pre-roll ads, particularly skippable pre-roll ads, like this. This is what's known as an eye tracking heat map. The areas that are darker are areas where people are paying attention. And what's fascinating about eye tracking is you can actually look in real time at what people are looking at. What was fascinating is that 69% of the time, when approached with a skippable pre-roll ad, the first thing we look at is the skip button. We don't even spend one moment to ascertain who the brand is, what their message is. We immediately gravitate to the bottom right. Now, you can go one step further with eye tracking, which is not just to see attention, but to measure emotion. 
There are these things that we do that we don't even control. Even as we're scrolling on our devices on our couch alone, we make micro expressions that indicate how we feel about things. So we can measure actual emotion as we browse the web. And so we applied this emotional tracking towards these sk skippable pre roll ads. And what we found was that as you track second by second, when, when you start to click on a video and then an ad pops up, the initial emotion is sadness. <laughs> but then it flips at exactly 3.5 seconds when you're one moment away from being able to click the skip button, the sadness is replaced with joy. So then we asked ourselves, given the opportunity to skip an ad, who actually doesn't skip? Who chooses to opt in and watch this? Because we could not find any population. So we started to explore, is it a gender thing? Is it a, a demographic thing? Is it a location thing? Are there different behaviors in different countries? And the only thing that we could find that was a decent indicator of what consumer chooses to opt in to watch an ad that they could otherwise skip is one population, one population only, and that's people over the age of 55. Now, when we're presented with this data, and data in our day-to-day -day jobs, we are of two minds about this, right? Because we're all consumers. So on one hand, if you work at an agency or brand and you look at a piece of creative, you say, I know whether this creative is good or not. I know whether it has an impact on me. But then there's another little voice in your head that says, I don't know if I should listen to that gut because I'm just one data point, I'm in the industry, my mind probably works very differently than other consumers. I work at an ad agency, I work at a publisher, I work at a brand. I shouldn't extrapolate my own feelings about the effectiveness of advertising onto my potential customers. And this causes cognitive dissonance because we have this debate in our mind of should I actually use myself as a data point to determine whether ads work or not. And so what was interesting is when we took the same research I just shared with you across a general populace and applied it to triple lift employees, we found that they were eerily similar. People in our industry had the same predilections and same behavior as those who are outside of our industry. We extended this eye tracking to look not just at pre-roll ads, but also at outstream video ads. And what we found is essentially that as the consumer reads the content, they're engaging with it heavily. And when presented with an ad in the middle of an article, they basically ignore it entirely. They continue with the text below it. And so we looked into this phenomenon, because this was quite unusual and quite odd, that people had basically, even though this ad was in the center of the page, right as they were seeing something, it's hard to miss it. It's hard to skip it, in fact. They didn't give any attention to it. And so we looked within the body of academic research and found there's a term for this called banner blindness. And in fact, banner blindness has been referenced over 50,000 times in academic research. It's extensively studied. In fact, in the last year alone, over 3,600 times in academia was the term banner blindness mentioned within published research papers. That was fascinating. But what was more fascinating is we took presentations like the one I'm doing right now on this stage from YouTube of major industry conferences and fed it into a caption transcription to determine how many times banner blindness was mentioned at events like this. We found out that banner blindness was not mentioned a single time in industry events like this one, even though it was mentioned thousands of times within academic research. How unusual. And so I think we have to ask ourselves, why does cognitive dissonance exist at all in our industry? And I think it's helpful to answer that question by looking at the fundamental business model that pays all of our bills, the online advertising ecosystem, which, by the way, is so simple and elegant, it could be described in less than 30 seconds. A brand gives money to a publisher, who in turn for that money serves ads to a consumer, and the consumer, hopefully, gives attention or purchase consideration to the brand. This is the business model that we are all in. It's one of the biggest business models in the history of commerce. But something strange happens with this business model at times. And I think you all understand, maybe those ads are not getting the same attention or purchase consideration that the brand might have hoped. Maybe the click-through rate is too low. The viewability needs to come up. Maybe the completion rate needs to be improved. 
So the agency or the brand calls up the publisher and says, if you want to stay on this media plan, I'd like you to fix this. So the publisher, what do they do? They need to fix it because their livelihood depends on it. So they, in turn, tell their ad ops people, what have you, we need to serve bigger ads, better ads, ads that are going to get our click-through up, our attention up. And in doing so, they actually are able to achieve the brand's and agency's objective, but it comes at the direct expense of the publisher and the consumer. The problem with this is we're all consumers. The publisher is a consumer. Everyone who works at the publisher is a consumer. Everyone who works at the agency is a consumer. Everyone who works at the brand is a consumer. And so at some level, they have cognitive dissonance because my job is to get high performance on this campaign. But the other part of me that's a human being finds these intrusive, interruptive, bigger ads objectionable. And therein lies the core of cognitive dissonance that we may all feel to some extent in our day-to-day -day jobs. And so what we're experiencing now is an entirely new business model that I'd like to share with you. Rather than putting the brand at the top, which feels very natural because ultimately the brand is the one who pays the bills, this new business model puts people at the top. And you'll notice we don't use the word consumer. Consumer implies that we're walking, talking credit cards, right? But rather, we are people. We have emotions. We feel certain things. And so when we put people at the top, the idea is to design ad experiences for people. Now, as we know, generally speaking, people don't like ads. But if you explain to people, and I'm talking about people like our parents, our nieces and nephews, our children, normal people, if you explain to them that this is the cost of using the internet, is getting ads, rather than taking out your credit card for every website, you see ads, they say, okay, that makes sense. Then you ask them a question. Well, given the fact that this is the cost of using the internet, how would you like the ads to work? And they say things like, well, I'd like them to be easily skippable. I'd like them to be elegant. I'd like them to be non-intrusive. I'd like them to blend in. I'd like them to be aesthetically pleasing. And if you design ads for them, the, the hypothesis is, they will reward that ad with higher engagement because it's designed for their needs in mind. If a consumer is paying more attention to the ads, the brand is happier and therefore willing to pay more money to the publisher, who in turn, rather than serving bigger, more intrusive ads, serves respectful ads. And in this new business model that's emerging, the wonderful consequence is that everyone wins. It's not a matter of taking from one party and giving to another, rather, the brand, the publisher, and people, all needs are met. And you don't have the cognitive dissonance problem that we see and feel each day in our lives. And when I talk about these intrusive ads, it's important to talk about what I mean. When we ask consumers, it's things like, I'm reading an article and suddenly the article gets pushed away and some video ad emerges. Or perhaps I want to watch a minute clip and I have to sit through an unskippable 30 second ad. Why do I have to do that? And so, our company, TripleLift, has been doing our own very small part to try and address this cognitive dissonance and build a new video ad product that meets the needs of users, which is non-interruptive, non-intrusive video ads, that meets the needs of publishers, meaning it complements the user experience of their site, and last, how does it make sense for the marketer? How does it actually drive better engagement and better awareness than other existing ad formats? And so we call this new ad experience that I'd like to share with you today, branded video. And branded video looks like this. It's a video ad experience like no other. It blends in beautifully into the context of the page, but it has things beyond just a video. It provides cues and messages in the form of headline, caption, and branding elements to share a much richer message beyond just the video creative, but also text. It also goes above and beyond in terms of disclosure to make it abundantly clear to the consumer that what they're engaging with is in fact an ad and not editorial content. And you may look at, your, look at this and say, I've actually seen this before. This looks like native video. But what's interesting about this is it's not transacted or bought like native video at all. It's used existing video ad assets like VAST and VPay tags through video workflows and DSPs and transacted and measured exactly like video. And of course, creating a user-friendly ad product is no good if it can't scale. So fortunately, the reason why we chose to announce it here today at IB Engage is this ad product is now 
the third largest scale video ad solution globally, according to Google, after Google itself and then Verizon Media Services. And so once we designed this, we had to determine before we release it to customers like you, does this thing actually work? Is it true to our promise of driving better engagement? We know it's better for consumers, but is it actually going to hit the KPIs that brands and agencies require in order to run it? And so we began running the same exact eye tracking and compared against Outstream. Whereas Outstream was skipped, consumers, because they had rich contextual branding clues as to what they're looking at and whether they want to engage with it, engage with the ad heavily. And so you see with the eye tracking, consumers actually give attention to branded video, whereas they didn't for Outstream. This is fascinating because Viewability has become the norm, but now we're, we're learning about a new metric, which is both of these ads are 100% viewable according to Moat and IES, but one of these ads was actually seen, not just viewable, but viewed. So we asked a survey after the people had seen the Outstream ad and the people had seen the branded video ad, and it turns out 38% more people could remember the brand that they saw in the branded video ad, which is plain to see. It's actually hard to tell who's the advertiser on the left, and it's quite clear when it says, eat a Snickers, you're not you when you're hungry, sponsored by Snickers, who the marketer is. And so if you are here today and you are a marketer, brand, or agency, and you're curious, what would a branded video look like for my brand? Or perhaps you're a publisher and want to understand how would branded video fit within the natural experience of your site, we'd love to offer you a complimentary mock-up example of branded video if you email brandedvideo at tripleif.com. Together as an industry, we're ushering in a new era of a people-first business model. And together, we're going to turn the cognitive dissonance we feel each day in our lives into harmony. Thank you so much.